Yeah, I gotta hand it to Sony. Whatever else I may have to say about Morbius. Um, I'm sitting here, I'm in real time, I just watched Morbius for the first time on Netflix. And uh, <laughs> it just, out of the entire movie, and I watch movies specifically for the journey of like, both enjoying it and taking it apart, like analyzing it. And uh, as a creator or a creative person, like, not that I've ever even tried to write a movie script before, but someday I hope to make myself try and do one. I always watch almost every movie with the perspective of like, hmm, would I be happy with that result? Like, as if this were my movie, right? Like, would I have done that? Did I like the way that turned out? If that's what I wanted to do, how would I have done it differently? Or what would I not do, you know? And, uh, I, man, I got to do a show. Uh, I guess I'll have to do an episode about Morbius. Or maybe this is just it right here. Um, but I had many a puzzling, interesting moments in my mind, given that context I just spelled out for you, uh, during this film. And one of the things I had to concede is like, well, it's not as absolutely horrible as some of the haters and naysayers may have wanted us to think, or me to think, uh, or whatever, audience to think, um... And it certainly isn't as good as anybody who may have been talking it up <laughs> would prefer to imagine. But, uh, you know, I've seen worse. I've seen better. And in the vampire category of films, it's just rough, right? Like, the big thing with Morbius is like, is he a vampire? Or isn't he? But that's a whole, that's a me hang up. <laughs> but I didn't have, throughout the whole movie, Never once did I, like, laugh out loud or, you know, emote, gesticulate in a raw moment of, like, oh, I got caught up in the moment and ha ah! Like, I love it when a, and I don't mean just, like, a bad or effective technical spook jump scare moment. I mean, like, getting caught up in the movie. Because included in my weird, bizarre, multi you know, multi-layered, complicated way that I enjoy consuming cinema because i think of it all as cinema even the worst of it <laughs> to be fair and 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 regal and grandiose um i still want to have that essential awe swept away moment of like it's fantasy it's escapism it's entertainment i want to be swept up in something that, that that then surprises me and catches me off guard or something, right? Like the whatever that, that je ne sais quoi that, uh, that is the, the magic of the movies. And <laughs> I got to hand it to them. They got me at the very end <laughs> with the second kicker. I just, I finally had like a movie fan moment. I finally felt like um, and I guess this is a sort of attitude that I walk into cinema now, especially as an old, as an older person. I'm not quite old yet. I don't think. Not, not, not trying to be rude, you know, just, I'm right there in the precipice. Um, but I want my inner child to be activated, you know, and be, and be caught up in that, but also want to enjoy like this, the cerebralness of, of, of my of my adult mind and its creative capacities and weirdnesses. And, um, and that part of it is the, like, if, if the inner child is about the awe and the magic of storytelling, then the adult mind is in part about the nerdy, the nerdiness, right? Cause then that, that's, that's culture. Not that young people don't have nerdiness and, and the culture of fandom. I just mean that like as an old person, anyways, I'm overanalyzing it, but as a, <laughs> as an adult viewer of, of, uh, of, of you know all kinds of movies all kinds of cinema um i appreciate those moments that catch me off guard or that make me a fan right both in the sort of like ooh wonder and mystique of the earliest moments of the first movies you ever saw where like the world fell away right i want that, that and i consider that a zen thing i don't think that's a movie thing i think that's a human um phenomena of 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 sensory apparatus thing when the world falls away and you're caught up in the moment of whatever it is you're consuming, whether it's 
storytelling live in person in the, in the theater modalities or in just in the conversation of, of great storytelling or whatever. Um, and nothing else is there. You're just either lucidly dreaming while awake or I don't know what it is, right? But it happened for me in this second kicker. I don't even know. What, I paused it. I loved it so much. And my critic analytic mind wanted to chime in so quick. And then the, you know, the producer was like, well, we might as well fucking hit record. I've got this chorus of voices in my head. Just like, what's her name in her new book? Who's, I can't remember her name and therefore can't. That's okay. That way they won't sue me. Um, some cool, awesome actress uh, with a great sense of humor that I, I whose work I know I'm not familiar with. But suddenly, that's one of the reasons that I like late night talk show TV. It's like, oh, who is this person? I don't know. But do they suck? Are they funny? Are they not funny? Do I like the clip? Um, and I know, I know, I know. What is a Zenist doing, you know, longing for the days of David Letterman and Johnny Carson? I don't know. I'm still a movie nut, you know, um, and a, and a, and a TV enthusiast to a certain degree. Please see the pins on the corkboard about all the, uh, problematic issues, as you might call them, about any media source so as to not get sidetracked. Um, the... The, let me wrap up my, my note here. There's a lot about the beginning of Morbius that I would have done differently if I had been on board, right? If I'd been on the team, if, if I was one of the three people that wrote the script, or if I'd been a producer, I don't know, whatever imaginary theoretical. And I say this with all due respect to everyone involved, um... Because I'm not really a critic, and I'm not really a, I'm not licensed to be a, a cinema critic, at least not yet. Um, but I am writing my own fan fiction about the world of cinema, where I am a licensed, you know, critic. Um, the beginning is just like I don't know. I don't even want to get into that because I promised myself that I would do that tomorrow live, right? Like on the air, and this is a pre-recorded note, and it's already going on seven minutes. The end, though, like, for the final fight and then the delightfully surprising, um, like, multi-kicker credit, like, multi-credit sequence, uh, that, honestly, for a hot minute there, and this is a compliment to everyone involved, and I don't mean, I hope it's not taken, uh, poorly or in, 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 you know, in a sort of misinterpreted way. The end of Morbius was like, ah, yes, this is the kind of thing I loved about um, the the title sequence at the end of, although it didn't have any kickers or uh, whatever you call them, post credit, you know, s- s- you know, spoiler riddled scenes or teasers or whatever. I like kicker, um, but uh, but Wandavision, and please do see my episodes about Wandavision to get the context and all that. But like that title, se- I was in love. With every inch of that show, to like think in, in, you know, film footage, from the opening moments of every episode, um, and how it was, you never knew what to expect because it was different almost every time, to the consistency the, of the, of the mind-bogglingly beautiful and abstract, yet also simultaneously like specific and revelatory and illuminating and contextual um credit sequence and that animation that like i don't know if people thought of that or people stayed to watch it or people skipped it um in terms of what was the most common i was in love with with just that stuff uh and after wondering if i was going to be like oh man i'm gonna have to give morbius a bad review like it found its identity somehow and at the end i was like you know what this is at this point in, in my career this is sort of like my B plus comment. I'd watch the sequel. If there was a Morbius 2, I'd watch it without prejudice. Because this thing sort of became something interesting. Um, and I don't know. Uh, as always, friends, please be advised. I, I, I rarely have ever read the comics. I'm a big comic movie fan. Not quite nerd because I don't memorize stuff anymore about things. Um... Shout out to my old buddy Chris from high school who could literally, like, quote for you any statistical, like, trivia quibbit about Star Wars. 
he knew that movie in those movies back in the day on on VHS before they ruined the Ewoks final credit celebration of magical tribal dancing under the stars with that 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 release that shall not be discussed um during that golden era of like we could watch Star Wars whenever we wanted to he knew every moment every beat every breakdown every prop count every... anyways i'm sidetracking beyond sidetracking uh shout out man okay morbius let me just i'll just jump in right into the things the big thing i would have done differently is the relationship between and i've completely forgotten his name which is terrible because i'm literally looking at a fr i have not finished watching it um the dude from house of dragons uh you know the the, the if morbius is the anti-hero then um his 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 blood brother almost literally if not you know alliteratively and and symbolically and figuratively um whatever quimby whatever the hell his made up name was i can't remember either his real name or his name milo finally came back okay uh I would not have kept Milo off the boat. Because the biggest place where I just went, um, you're losing me, guys, was like when he tells Milo that he needs, you know, like, you know let's, let's go for a walk. And like right then and there, they've been so close and, you know, it's like he should have been on the boat, which I think it would have done wonders for the rivalry. Um, I was so... concerned with the with the lack of clarity that was happening after that you know, let's take a walk scene between all of that and when morbius like jumps off the boat and goes back to the thing and the, and the fbi suddenly becomes a character in the movie um and i gotta put a pin on that because for like comic relief, um, cop, sidekick guys, both those actors were severely underutilized, right? Like it was just mm, that those beats kept missing the mark. Um, all the things that the funny guy should have been really funny about for me just weren't. I was like, oh, they're trying to be funny. And that's, that's never what you want. You never want the audience to think, oh, look, they're trying to be funny. And that's what I kept feeling, uh, in, all, in all honesty. And I wanted to like them because I was like, "Oh, cool!" There's like, there's like a whole Batman esque sort of. Um, this movie, I, I toyed with the idea of thinking this might be a critique. At one point, I really sort of, I almost wanted to pause the movie and make a recording then because I had this thought just like flew across the back of my head. This movie's trying to be some mashup between like batman from you know batman uh and uh, uh if there was ever i'm sure there was like a show or a or a cartoon or something just about the cop right i i uh, you know um what's his name the cop that batman always talks to whose name is totally just like air file not found right now uh and the hulk it, it's like and spider-man uh and there was some other character I'm like with a little bit of this mixed in and it's like i and i couldn't quite decide if it was working for me or not um all the actors did fine not their best work not their worst and and i i don't know i didn't think there was anything to be to be panning anybody for it was really just structural it was really truly structural it was it was the way the scenes a, it felt like we rushed to the reveal of Morbius in his full Morbius mode too too brutally intensely. It's like it was breaking the time honored tradition of great heart. Is more yeah. Another question: Is this trying to be more of an action comic movie, or or is it trying to honor horror too? And it feels like that's what was missing. It was too much uh, action 
comic book superhero, but there was no clear superhero, right? Like Morbius sort of tries to become something by the end. And I'm trying to, that's why I'm dying to find out what this next fi- final, perhaps, kicker. Apparently I still have seven minutes and 49 seconds, but a lot of that is like the the really boring credits, right? Um, but no one ever, hardly ever reads unless they know somebody way at the end. Uh, I, okay, for context, just in case you didn't know, I'm the kind of guy that if, and even if, sometimes even if I didn't like the movie, I will sit through the end of the credits of almost every movie unless I feel absolutely certain that there will not be a kicker because someone told me or because I just know that there won't be. It's not the kind of movie, right? When it just you just know when there won't be. But then the, the curiosity, like I love kickers. I love like oh look, neat something at the end. Every most of the people left, and especially in the context of watching it in a in a theater. Um, and the the way that Marvel has made it emblematic, part of their brand, part of their universe, and a way of literally moving. Uh, story forward uh, I dig it now it's like we're in a new it's like the 3.0 like we're about to emerge into the 4.0 version of like kickers or we're about to go into some you know feast and famine I guess we're, we, we're in danger of everyone except Marvel and I guess perhaps Sony doing kickers like not doing kickers and like people poo pooing them and everyone thinking they're you know over um but I'm fascinated because cinema is cinema. Like you've got, if you've got their eyeballs and you, and you've gotten them to sat through the credits, um, it should be something that, that is part of the world, part of the storytelling, part of the magic, uh, part of the fandom, you know, that's contributing to the, to the culture of the fandom. That's going to churn the ticket sales, right? Like ultimately, if you really think about it. But, but it's got to serve the audience as, as, as much as the, as the storytelling. Um, and and the, the franchise, right? You've got to get people to see it. And I say that with as little cynicism as possible. So I digress. Like the big thumbs up that I really had to give Sony is like, you got, I, I said this out loud unconsciously and I wish I'd already been tape recording. Like I want to be able to do, I want to be able to have a show, pin, this is Manifestation Corkboard talk. I want to be able to show where like, I literally get to talk through the movie and I somehow get away with it and not get sued. Um, and I don't, I mean, people do that, right? Like people, people on the internet do watch party shows. I just don't know how you get away with it without, um, I guess I got to like play music and just not play any of the movie sounds and have headsets on the whole time. Ah, I'll figure it out. Uh, this is my equivalent. I digress. I sat up and said out loud, I gotta hand it to you, Sony. When you tried to do Marvel, you truly tried to do Marvel and you really lean in. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a compliment uh, uh, to people I don't even know over at Sony. Um, I can't claim to have seen a lot of Sony films and I got some opinions about what they've done with Spider-Man, especially over the long haul. I generally sort of don't hate any of the Spider-Man movies because since long time ago, since I ever, uh, discovered as a, you know, as in that golden era of discovering things that you enjoy, um, and, and characters you want to, you want to root for and, you know, be a, be a fan of, um, as, as a very, very young person with a deep curiosity and a very vivid imagination and a, like, I wanted to be Spider-Man kind of, level of fandom for Spider-Man, I've had a Spider-Man thing. And it's it's in part from the cartoons, but not so much. It's really from, like, coming across the comic books and seeing them and knowing that they exist, but never really getting into buying them. Uh, mostly because, um, I don't know, I don't know, they were sort of, I don't know if my folks are, like, not into them or they just didn't realize it was a thing, but I don't know. Um, I love going to bookstores, though, and flipping through them. And Spider-Man was my thing. Uh, just knowing that it was a cultural phenomenon, comic books. They seem magical to me, but also sort of like, 
fragile and easy to, to mess up and also sort of like too too quick to flip through to not why would I buy them when I could just go to the bookstore and flip through them for free? Um, not that I was that cynical of a child. I just didn't get it. Um, but but most specifically because of the... And these are... I don't know if I'm some sort of mandala effect other universe or... And I don't, I don't really believe in the mandala effect because I know that the universe is a multitude of probabilistic tunnels of, prob, you know, fractal... See the pin on the cork board. Um, the, you know, the, it's all real. The multiverse is real. Uh, there's an infinity of probabilities being made manifest by probability waveform function tunnels of quantum physics, perpetuating all possible outcomes vis-a-vis the nodes of consciousness that manifest in the living web of the hologram. But I digress. Uh, some people would tell me, I've told me to my face and or on the internet um, that they're like, these movies don't exist and I'm insane. Or, you know, I'm from some other universe. But there was a set of Spider-Man movies. Maybe they were made for TV. Maybe it was uh, a TV show that I only saw a handful of episodes of. But I thought it was Spider-Man movies that I missed in theaters that magically got to be on TV. Um, whereas back in the day, there weren't a lot of... It was probably made for TV, like, miniseries or something. Or special TV movies. But there was a set of Spider-Man movies where Spider-Man wasn't in high school... But was kind of like Superman working uh, in the big city, and uh, you know, more of a more adultish, so a little bit less of like the the you know, um, and it was just old school seventies, goofy, weird, hilarious, you know, obviously real in camera special effects, and one of my niche like things about tv and film is the special effects i've always since the beginning have been nerded out because i've known i i've you know i just always always known i'm sure it was because when my parents sat me down they were really explicit like television is fake it's a story being told to you by actors like in a theater you know except that instead of it going to the theater in a little room with lights and stuff they you know they they film it And then we get to watch the film. I didn't understand how the TV worked exactly. Um, Except, you know, in the same rudimentary way every kid does. But um, I loved... These were were on every once in a while. And I just loved them. They were campy. They were awesome. The music was 70s and kind of low-key funkalicious with some some rhythm somewhere. Some weird, wacky, crazy things. They reminded me of Wonder Woman. And I was in love with... um, and forgive me, I, she's the love of my life and I cannot remember her name because I'm terrible with names, but I'm looking at her face and, and hearing her voice as Wonder Woman, not Diane Keaton for crying out loud, my crazy part of the brain that remembers names. Linda Carter, um, right? I think. Or she a tennis player? Linda Carter. Yes. I'm 65% sure it's Linda Carter. I've been in love with Linda Carter my entire life. Can't believe I just said that out loud on a podcast. But then again, this is for short story writing, so it's all fiction anyways. Um, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. This is all about Morbius. <clears throat> so, from that era on, from like, from like the, me, from when I was watching I Love Lucy, Magnum P.I., Three's Company, and whatever comic book stuff and, and Saturday morning cartoons were on. Um, you know, Wonder Woman, Charlie's Angels, you know, all that nonsensically fluffy TV that was adorable and also kind of problematic in certain ways. And, and you know, all the things, the glaringly weird things that it is to today. I've been a fan of the special effects and the sound design and the technical details of a film. Or a presentation. As much as anything else about it, right? So, back to Morpheus, finally. Um, Key things. The beginning wasn't working for me. It it was the, the bats and the use... I mean, I know this is all from the comics. And I don't know how much this... Like I said, never read the comics, but... Does this reading the comics feel like it's 
trying a little bit, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, to be like Batman? Or isn't it? Or doesn't it? If it doesn't, then I'm sad that they somehow stumbled into making the movie feel a little bit like, ah, Batman, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, stylistically, you know, the, just the, the choices, the, what are we looking at? We're looking at a cave full of bats and the sky's getting swept up in, in, in bringing them home to put them in a fish tank for flying mammals, um, which he does somehow without, with, uh, with and or without government licensing and or without permitting and or without any of his staff understanding or questioning it. Like, the nurse that he kills later, and I get it. I get they were trying to build... See, like, the flaws. Let's lay out some of the flaws. You know, the romantic tension was just sort of... I don't know. It felt a little phoned in. I, I'm glad, I guess, that she becomes a vampire at the end. But them falling in love and there being, a, a, like, an envy, you know, unrequited love, love triangle... It all would have been stronger if they hadn't have kept, not Quimby, what's the friend's name? The guy from Game of Dragon Thrones, um, part two, the prequel, for clarity, whatever his name is, please don't, don't get mad at me. This is, it's, it's a comedy bit. This is just a comedy bit. No, for reals, my brain doesn't work that well when it comes to names. Um, character development for the characters I'm writing in my books. All the above. But also, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, <laughs> the things that didn't work, the romance, just the way it developed, it was, meh, didn't work, wasn't working for me. And I think that if the friend had been more in the loop, whatever his name is, it, it, like the name thing, I didn't need it. As a bond, like there was enough. They were literally like fake, you know, blood brothers from another mother's to each other because they had the same disease. Um, would have loved to know a little bit sooner that Quimby was super wealthy, rich, and could fund everything. So we got a little bit of um, Iron Man by association, you know, rich guy, rich billionaire playboy. In this case, um, incel virgin apparently, that's angry at the world and wants to go pick up on chicks but fails and then kills people about it. None of that worked for me. Um, I I realized that, you know, my big question at the very beginning after he takes the bats and then starts ad openly admitting that he's doing something that's not legal and will be looked on, you know, frowned upon by society, but he has to do it to save himself and his buddy. Um... Where's the bad guy? Except that he's become a bad guy. Like, he's made himself... Like, it's all gone wrong. Would have loved... Instead of rushing into that, would have loved... And in, instead of so much going on with the kids, I would have loved a little less of their youth, a little more of their friendship as adults, dealing with their disease in their dynamic duo, doers of... Char like, I didn't even know he was still in touch with the guy during that whole scene about how he rejected the Nobel Peace Prize. And so he's a bad boy who brags about it to his patients, who then he puts into a coma and forgets about for the rest of the movie. None of that worked for me. Would have been all that different. I mean, I guess he saves her. That was an, I mean, that was an attempt at saving the cat. Not that I'm calling the patient the little girl a cat. I'm just saying, you know, if you know film... There's the there's the mechanism, save the cat. You gotta save the cat in the first act. If you've got a you know, a hero that doesn't know they're gonna, you know, become a hero. Um, especially with an anti hero, like he's gotta have the capacity to save people, or else you really like where where what's the belief? What's the mechanism by which he becomes good if he's if he's become bad? It, oh, Jekyll and Hyde. Throwing in a little Jekyll and Hyde in here, are we? Um both the old school and the new, because it's like, whoa, what is he doing? Did he, did he want to become a vampire? How did we not, how did we not, I don't know if it's just not talked about in the comic books, but in this day and age, in like it's 2022, and he's willing to do radically dangerous human, ex illegal human experimentation. 
after turning down the Nobel Peace Prize for saving millions of lives by doing something that in and of itself is freaking too amazing to sort of like, we didn't even get to boggle our, we didn't even get to enjoy that. He, what? If artificial blood? What? Like, where's the fun sci-fi? Like, we missed out the chance to be sci-fi nerdy futurists about that um, and really sort of get some nerddom about, like, the science about artificial blood. How does it work? So then the, you know, the fun, we're making up slang, red versus blue. So Matrix reference, mm, wink, wink, don't touch, say no more. Um, you know, are you on the red? Are you on the blue? Did you drink the red? Did you drink the blue? Uh, I mean, it made sense. It was obvious. But it also didn't make sense. And I could totally see people totally not getting it for the longest time. Um, we just could have had that fun sort of back to the future ask from that. I don't know. Maybe I'm stuck in the 90s and like the 80s, 90s sandwich of of uh, the kinds of movies that didn't spoon feed it to you. But definitely gave you a moment to be like, aha, there it is. Like. You want to dangle a mystery and then give a little bit of an answer. Um, and in comic book stuff, when it's it's technology, we want the technology to be nerdy and kind of believable. And this is something they did not do very well. And he's supposed to be... So he's got that little bit of Iron Man. At the end of the movie, he starts cobbling together equipment in that new lair that he literally steals from a guy who says, You want to take my lair? So wait, why... Why did we pass up an opportunity to recruit henchmen? Is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? Is he a, is he a rough and tumble anti-hero good guy that's above the law? We don't know yet. In theory, we'll find out in the next movie. That's why I'm like, you know what? I'll watch a sequel. I'll watch a sequel. But, man, if I had been around to give my feedback, and I don't know what, you know, obviously, the industry is the industry, and sometimes you start out strong and it gets whittled away because the money people with a little way. And then sometimes it starts out not so strong and it gets worked with because, you know, there's concerns about being not so strong and you, you land somewhere that's not quite as strong as people talk themselves into thinking it, it might be. Um, or it's strong on paper, but it just doesn't read on film. You know, there's all kinds of ways that uh, a good idea can kind of waffle. And I'm not saying it waffled. It just, it didn't, it didn't kick off strong. The opening was like, trying to be dark and pensive and ponderous, there was this conflict of, like, we're going to be gritty and real. So for a little bit, like, we're kind of living in a in 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 a New York City that's like, oh, is this supposed to be gritty and harsh like Seven? Because uh, isn't, that, isn't that a really harsh, gritty, graphic, very real uh, cop uh, serial murder? Because he's sort of framed. He's He isn't framed. He does commit serial murder, or at least mass murder in one instance of the boat, which apparently the FBI's feathers are not very ruffled by about. Um, <laughs> uh, so many things that just uh, creaked along and showed me what they wanted to be, but weren't it in a sort of, ah, yeah, sweep me up, make me laugh, um, you know, spook me out a little bit. I was never creeped out. I There was a little bit of like, uh, all of the Wolfman movies, sort of werewolfy, like, oh, it's about watching the transformation. But okay, but then the initial transformation was where, oh, we didn't actually get to watch it. He starts shaking and then he disappeared. And, uh, it was a bit too many, it got a little Frankenstein-y as a film, a bit too many pieces of too many other kinds of films that we could right, clearly see were pieces of the puzzle in terms of the way the movie's made. Uh, and, and the way the script is written, I think. You know, just from an audience perspective. From a, I'm a particularly nitpicky audience uh, member. So, in terms of what I would have done, like I was saying, I would have put the friend on the boat. I would have made the, the romantic triangle thing, would have seed, I would have sown those seeds a little sooner, but not as so soon as, like, putting her in their childhood, uh, which I could see is a possibility of someone wanting to do. Um... Not that I know that, you know, I don't know anything. I don't nerd out so much that I read about what has or has not happened that didn't turn, end up on screen except passively. Uh, I would have, but I would have played that card a little sooner and I would have kept that friend tighter in the loop, let that, you know, attempt at, is there a natural, or, like, for example, here's what I mean a little sooner with the romance in the triangle. 
one way it could be set up is that like she's interested in Morbius. Morbius does is blind and kind of oblivious to it because he just wants to do the science. And Willoughby is into her and misreads some of the cues to think there's a glimmer of hope, but but wonders if that respect she has for Morbius is more than just respect, you know, and is trying to catch her eye without falling into one-upmanship and, and you know, junior high age rivalry chest beating. Something like that that brings them all onto the boat under slightly more interesting... Um, we're all, they are already a dynamic trio, right? He's the rich guy funding all the good Justice League type work. Um, Mimby, Quimby, Millaby, um, blonde haired guy, Dragon Boy. I'm going to call him from now on because I cannot remember for the life of me either any of the names. Um, Morbius is like the brains, right? He's sort of like the smart Hulk, eventually. We hope. I hope he gets to a smart Hulk. It was never, um, and it, tragically, it was never strong enough that he didn't, like, did he black out? Did, the mystery about whether or not he killed the nurse didn't, wasn't very strong, didn't play. I mean, it was a little bit at the beginning for me, like, did he just kill his nurse? But that didn't last very long when I was like, no, nah, he didn't. He could, he didn't. Um, and then I was like, oh, duh, Avi. Because um, I'd already thought that the friend was going to either try, I thought we were going to make a big drama about trying to get the serum out from under Morbius. But I think if all of that had sort of started on the boat, with all three of them on the boat, and we'd spend a little more time on the boat instead of just crash course right into the, oh, I think I have feelings for you and I'm scared for your safety. And why, why all the safety, like, why is Morbius in a room with like, safety glass and locking doors in the first place if he thinks he's curing himself not turning into the hulk right like he very curiously has anti-hulk gear and an an entourage of armed men i didn't get that at all sure doing unsanctioned human experimentation on a boat you probably hire security because someone might be trying to uh, take your stuff, right? Because you're paranoid and you know about espionage and, and, and uh, you know, co both corporate and, and otherwise, etc. But not because, I mean, did he... Unless he was worried about hulking out, right? Of more BSing out to not to not abuse the, the Hulk crossover uh, coinky dinkiness of it all. So I would have tried to make that clear. Were they aware, as a sort of trio, romantic triangle of, of um, there we get into some cliches, right? Where, like, is she flirting with all three? And is, um, we get into this whole, like, ooh, maybe one of them thinks there might be a menage a going on. We could have gotten, because he's a vampire. Vampires are supposed to be sexy, and it just wasn't sexy enough. You could tell it was trying to make it get to a sexy vibe place, but it didn't work for me. Especially not to justify outrageous jealousy on the part of Mimby Quimby, blonde-haired dragon boy, you know, to induce mass murder and also then take the girl hostage and use her as, a, as bait. Which, we get in, which gets very much into, like, you know, Superman, what's his, re what's his real weakness? Lois Lane. Right? So, like... The stakes weren't there for that, for me. And I think, honestly, in the boat, from the beginning, maybe with a little bit of like, oh shit, I might, we might Hulk out. And with, we're both going to do this. We're in, because they are blood brothers. Why wouldn't they? Maybe Morbius goes first, because it's his idea, and the friend agrees to that, and there's a bit of a delay, and then there's like, eh. And here's the other level of it that I would have probably suggested. We're talking about evolutionary biology and like the body transforming into some polymorphic state of chimera, right? Like, that would take time. 
They were, in my humble opinion, I don't know what it says in the comic books, and I don't know what is or is not canon. But I would have tried to, if possible, given the parameters of, of the canon boundaries of the comic books. And who knows? Sometimes they totally change things because it'll work better, right? And they didn't. Then they ret, they retcon it. I finally learned what that means. Um, but I would have put a little bit of like mysterious suspense delay. Remember when the mouse, like, oh, you think it's dead? You think he's still got, you know, more trials to go? And then it's like, it bounced back! Where was that? We needed a little bit of that. Um, either in the, like, it risks, you know... In order for them to have a fight that makes sense about, no, I'm now burdened with this curse and you shouldn't do it to yourself, it would make way more sense. It would have way more stakes. It would be way more personal. If something goes sort of wrong... But then they think, you know, with Morbius, because he's insisted on going first. And, but in, not in a, ooh, I've hulked out into vampire Morbius kind of way, but in a sort of, uh, I almost died maybe kind of way. And then he's like, oh, I'm still messed up, and I, I'm not better. Kind of, uh, but at least I didn't die kind of way. And then there's like a, and now what do we do moment of moving on? Where they got to keep working on the science or whatever. And then... A sort of, I don't know, time lapse, time passage in this movie was really, except for the back, the flashback, didn't make any sense. Has it been a day? Has it been a week? That guy in the middle, the friend, the doctor friend, would have had his guts ripped out and would have died in moments. Not enough time to make a phone call and then let Morbius jog over. None of that worked for me. But putting the doctor's life on the line, I get that. Would have kept that. Would have made it hey, come on, special effects, guys. This is a fucking Marvel movie from Sony that's supposed to be darker and, you know, like more like DC, right? Isn't that the point of D- of Sony's doing Marvel stuff? Is it that they're, they're going to do it a little more darker than because they can? Because I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I'm over-interpreting the color schemes I see uh, in, in their stuff, but... Coulda, shoulda, woulda been gorier. Coulda, shoulda, woulda been more like Morbius was on a way to intercept it and prevent it than like, oh, I've got to call you to come tell you to stop him. Um, why didn't you just tell him on the phone, bro? <laughs> like, what? Like, none of that worked for me. But it was close. It wasn't horrible. See what I'm saying? Uh, again, maybe the fucking doctor should have been on the boat. When it comes to moral dilemmas... For my tastes, I prefer the dramatic developments of characters struggling with, we, sh- we all should have known better, we're all complicit when it comes to, we just did a thing together. Um, although I get it, the Doctor was sort of removed, and but he helped Morbius become Morbius by sending him off to that special school so he could be really, you know, put his talents to use and be as super smart as he could be, right? So... And if he's so important, and okay, am I am I way out of line here? When when the doctor, when the good doctor goes to Wimby Quimby's Dragon Boy's place and is like pleading with him, see, there's no moral. I didn't feel the moral tension there. I didn't feel the dramatic tension there, except for I was like, were they flirting with a little bit of like maybe homoerotic nuance of like they were more than patient doctor for a hot minute or approaching it or something was there a little bit of bromance going on um no because the other guy went to go pick up on chicks at a bar and then got failed and killed people about it maybe but then again you know could have been by I, I don't know it was just ambiguously ambiguous enough to me like is this supposed to be that kind of ambiguity or isn't it and why clear that up make it a stronger choice Go there or don't. And if you're not gonna, and because it doesn't need to be, right? I'm not saying you gotta throw in a lot of gay. And I'm not saying you gotta get really explicit. I'm just saying if there was romance between the two of them, or at least unrequited admiration or, or a weird, creepy... No, because then we get into a creepy place, right? Like, age difference is age difference, but he was treating them as children. So, nah, chuck that idea. As we spitball here live in the show. Um... If there was no flashback to their youth, but more of like a, hey, just, hey, here we are, uh, 
a couple of, you know, a scientist and a rich dude that's been doing this all their lives? Maybe, right? Um, so, clean, like, clean it up. Like, what was that scene about? And then he tries to kill him, but he doesn't kill him. It doesn't feed on him. But the first thing he says is, let me feed on you. Doesn't work for me. Let's make that, I mean, if, we, if we're going to... If that dude, if Mimi Quimby Dragon Boy's journey is all about like I'm gonna lean into this vampire bullshit, then why is he? Why isn't he already gotten like moved on from the girl that he can't get and gotten himself a vampire queen and is starting his brood? Right? Like, what's that about? They apparently can. Okay, get it. They were trying to reserve the whole aha because Morbius does in different ways and also literally say he's not that kind of vampire. <clears throat> at least not in terms of sun or holy water. But he can turn, he can turn them, we find out near the end. So, the leaning into Mimby Quimby, Dragon Boy, being like, I want to be this, would have all been stronger vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with him and the Doctor. If the Doctor had been on the boat, there was no weird ambiguity the pretend, potential, like, hey, maybe there was a little bit of something, something going on there. Um, instead, it was more like, we're in this shit together because we all got on this boat together. And um, they shouldn't have killed that nurse. Well, if they, were gonna, if they needed to kill that nurse, it should have happened at a different time, at a different place. Um, but all of that would have changed because they would have all been on the boat together. Like, that nurse would have been on the boat. Probably. How did that nurse who didn't know anything about the bats because he says something like, nobody knows what I'm doing in here. Or maybe everyone knows about the bats. I don't get it. Like, why was there an aquarium of bats that no one looked at and went, the fuck, dude? About, like, that nurse just didn't even re register it. It was just like, ignore the bats. Come here and tell me that the girl I just talked to is is bad and I got to put her in a coma. You know, like, that didn't work for me. But, it, but I think a lot of things would have gone stronger and we wouldn't have gotten to these weird awkward things if they'd all been on the boat and then we could have had a crime investigation you know law and order but it's the fbi kind of thing and that's what they were missing they wanted to go comedy they needed their law and order music cue bum 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 and maybe not maybe that's too much but um yeah the comedy beats should have could have would have been stronger um but not in a sort of overplaying it because it's not their movie kind of way just the, that right next level of like there's got to be someone in this movie that's really funny because Morbius isn't and by the way I think in terms of just the character like I was digging I was alright with it when he was talking it wasn't about what he said it's about what they did and how things played out the action right I would have loved to have been like teased and taunted about him becoming Morbius and it being a struggle that he's maybe... Tr Does he hide it? Um, do they all know? Like, it was so instantaneous. It was such a flash in the pan, one bad night in a boat, when it could have... Should have... Might have been, um, you know, a long, dark journey into the... Into, into the... The middle of nowhere. Um, they were so conveniently just off long, the shore of Long Island, which became comical to me. Um... And we could have had more of a mystery ghost boat returns thing if um, if we if we would have hashed out the transformation stuff like on a longer journey of the boat where they're all there and they got to deal with dude Morbius you've turned into a vamp you're turn you're becoming something other than a person <laughs> and we got to do something about this turn this boat around um, and it takes more than a hot three seconds for his body to pop, become polymorphic. And on the special effects note, I finally did sort of wrap my brain around what I thought they were trying to communicate visually, but the smoky, not quite bullet time, slow motion, is it supposed to be sound waves? No, it's not sound waves. What is it? Special effects of swirly smokiness that took on the color of his clothes? I didn't get it. I really didn't get it. Is he somehow magical now, too? Um, the controlling of the bats, 
I didn't really ever feel like there was a justifiable explanation. We should if if he suddenly has sonar hearing and and vision powers, he needs new organs in his brain, right? Like is he producing those sounds? Where are those sounds coming from? Where is the like is he make does he just suddenly have a giant bat gong for a third eye thing going? Like we need more science nerdiness there of believableness, right? To make it make sense. Though I did love at the end with the bats, right? Which was at the beginning sort of weak. Also, were all of the bats at the end just the bats that he brought back from Costa Rica or wherever he was at? Or did he like attract all the bats of the, you know, northern New England coastline? Like, I don't. Um, the building blocks were there, they were just really chonky to steal a term and probably misuse it. It was just too broad strokish. And then the action sequences were sort of like, meh, I'm not I'm not buying the stakes in this chase or in this fight. It just doesn't why did that moment have to be bullet time, but that gets sped up and then gets slowed down again? I needed more I needed more of a if he was gonna be ma- is he magical? I thought he was magical. He's not that kind of vampire. Or is he? Um is it if it if it's trying to be a very real you know how, like, there's comic book Batman movies, and then there's, like, the nitty-gritty, it's trying to be very real Batman movies, and then there's a sort of, we don't know, in-between ones. Um, and, and okay, what's with the second, the, was it the first kicker or the second kicker, where there's suddenly a giant interdimensional cosmic rift in over the skies of, I think it's supposed to be New York, or is it Gotham? <laughs> I mean, is it Gotham? Uh, what universe is this in? Oh, it's Marvel. So it's I'm presumably New York. If it is Marvel, where's the Marvel stuff? I mean, it is, it's in association with Marvel. They're running the logo. But is it like Venom, where there's no reference ever to any of the Marvel characters? It, I don't know. Is there reference to other characters from Marvel that I just didn't get? And also, my biggest question, when they ask him, very Batman, who are you? What are you? And he says, I'm Venom. What? I thought Venom was Venom. And isn't that Sony Marvel too? Like, isn't that Spider-Man Sony? Like, what is going on there? So Sony, I'll give you like a, (laughs) I'll give the movie a B plus. I give Sony like a C plus plus. But they they needed to go a little extra because they were really trying to make this some uh, feel like it fits inside the Marvel universe. But it but it was you know so so many structural things that were close but not strong enough for me. And I really I, there's I'm left with many many questions. And apparently I still have seven minutes left to go, so I'm going to stop now. <laughs>